All right. Well, I'm very blessed to be able to share the word with all of you and I appreciate the prayers and manifestations today. And what I'd like to talk about is what I've entitled God's seal. And I'm referring to the seal that we read about in the word. And I want to start in Ephesians chapter one. So if you would all turn there with me. And I am reading from the REV today. And uh, <clears throat> Ephesians chapter one and verse three, we read some really great things that God has done for us. And I'll start reading here in verse three. It says, blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in union with Christ, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and without blemish in his presence in love, having decided in advance that we would be adopted through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, for the praise of the glory of his grace, which he graciously gave us in the beloved one, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our transgressions, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us with all wisdom and insight. And let's see, having made known to us the sacred secret of his will, according to his good pleasure that he planned beforehand in him, with a view toward the administration of the fullness of times to unite us under one head all things in Christ, the things in the heavens and the things on the earth in him, in whom we were also claimed as God's possession, having been decided upon in advance, according to the purpose of the one who was working all things according to the plan of his will, to the end that we who had already hoped in Christ would be to the praise of his glory, in whom you also, when you heard the word of truth, the good news of your salvation, and when you believed in him, you were sealed. You were sealed with the promise of Holy Spirit, which is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of God's own purchased possession to the praise of his glory. You know, and that's just such a great section of scripture of the amazing things that God has done for us. So what I wanted to talk about is the nature of what a seal is when it says that we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Well, so, and the reason that I'm teaching on this, just to give you some background, is I am a licensed architect. And in order to get licensed, I had to go through college, get a college degree in architecture, and then I had to work for a minimum of four years in an architectural firm, and then I had to sit for some really grueling exams. And once I passed all those exams, then I was able to be licensed in the state of Maryland. And that you have to get licensed in every state if you wanna practice in that state. And so when I got licensed, then I get what's called an architect seal, which I will hold up this little stamp. I don't know if you can see it, maybe not so great because of my background, but so what happens is when an architect does a set of drawings and go through and we review those drawings and make sure that everything is according to building codes and everything is according to what's gonna hold up structurally, then we put that stamp on the drawing and sign it. And what that means is that we have acknowledged that those drawings are authoritative and ready for construction and that there are no, hopefully no uh, things about them that aren't gonna work. Of course, that's life, but we'll see. So, and then also just so you know, my wife was a, uh, a, a notary public. So if any of you have ever you know, had a will or any kind of official documents where you have to have an authorized signature, you know, you have to go to a notary. And when you sign that document, then they put their seal on that document that that signature is 
a legitimate signature that you in fact have signed it and somebody else hasn't come along and you know tried to uh, do something illegal but anyway so you know and she had she had this stamp that she would put on drawings and i know they also have an embossing thing where it actually embosses the paper and one other thing i thought was kind of interesting i don't know if any of you have ever done any plumbing work <laughs> Well, like changed out a shower head. But when you do, there's this stuff called uh, threaded seal tape that you put on. <laughs> you put on the, uh, the thread of the pipe. So when you put that shower head on, it doesn't leak. So a seal is something that has several different purposes. And I'll just read you kind of the definition that it's a seal is a device with a cut or raised emblem, symbol, or word used specifically to certify a signature or to authenticate a document. It's an impression, a device, or mark given the effect of a common law seal by statute law or by American local customs recognized by judicial decision. Or it's a medallion or ring face bearing such such a device incised so that it can be impressed on wax or moist clay, such as a signet ring. And it's usually uh, ornamental uh, adhesive stamp that may be used to close a letter or package. Anybody ever sent a, a birthday card and you have the little seal that you stick on the back of the envelope when you, <laughs> when you go to the store to get the envelope? And then also a seal like with the tape, it's something that secures to number one, prevent tampering, or number two, to prevent the passage of something between two items. So it's a closure that must be broken to be opened and as such reveals tampering. And it's a tight, perfect closure as against the passage of gas or water, i.e. the pipe thread or the seal tape. Now, back in, boy, 3,500 years ago in BC, records show the people of Mesopotamia used cylindrical seals as a mark of authenticity. By the time of the ancient Egyptians, the seal had become attached to a ring and pharaohs and other important people of the day would wear them to show their position. And this may start to remind some of us of some of the Old Testament records that I'd like to just briefly touch on here. So we're going to go to some of these. So we go all the way back to Genesis chapter 41. If you could turn there with me, Genesis chapter 41. And we're going to start reading. This is about when Joseph was taken into Egypt, you know, and he was in prison and then he was able to in interpret Pharaoh's dream. And we're going to start reading in verse 38 of Genesis 41. And it says, well, actually 37, it says, the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the spirit of, is the spirit of God, talking about Joseph. Pharaoh said to Joseph, because God has shown you all of this, you know, Joseph had interpreted Pharaoh's dream, there is none so discreet and wise as you. You will be over my house, and by your command will all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than you. Pharaoh said to Joseph, behold, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh took off his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and arrayed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot that he had. They cried out before him, bow the knee. He set him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh and without you, no man will lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. So, Joseph was giving, given just incredible authority in the land of Egypt, and he had that signet ring, which would be the indicator of that authority, that when he put that signet ring into whatever it would have been, clay or wax or whatever, that meant 
that it was just as good as the Pharaoh himself had said that. And so you can see the authority that was behind that signet ring. And then also we're going to go to uh, another section. And I'm going to be reading through several uh, verses here. So just bear with me. Or I hope we'll get through this without taking up too much time here. But we're going to 1 Kings chapter 21. And again, we're probably many of us are familiar with these records. And this is about um, what Jezebel and Ahab did. <laughs> which obviously was wicked stuff. And so we're going to start in uh, just reading in verse one. And it says, after these things, Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard that was in Jezreel next to the place of Ahab, the king of Samaria. And Ahab spoke to Naboth saying, give me your vineyard so that I may have it for a garden of herbs because it is nearby next to my house. And for it, I will give you a better vineyard than it is. Or if it seems good in your eyes, I will give you its value in silver. But Naboth said to Ahab, Yahweh forbid me from giving the inheritance of my fathers to you. And Ahab came to his house and he was really upset. <laughs> and we'll just skip through. So Jezebel's wife, uh, let's go down to uh, verse 7. It says, Jezebel, his wife, said to him, now you will exercise your kingship over Israel Ride and eat food and let your heart be merry. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she, Jezebel, wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters to the elders and to the nobles who were in his city who lived with Naboth and his city. And she wrote in the letters saying, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth as the head of the people. Then, this is amazing, seat two men, sons of Belial, before him and have them testify against him, saying, you curse God and the king, then bring him out and stone him so that he dies. And that's exactly what happened, is that these two individuals, the sons of Belial, made false uh, premises against him and, and, uh, they ended up stoning him to death, and then they, and then uh, when Ahab heard that Nahab, Naboth was dead, Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, to take possession of it. And later on, if, as we won't go there, but as we read that Ahab finally did um, repent from that because he realized the evil that was behind that. But you can see how when, when Jezebel sealed that letter, that was taken as the authority, even though it was obviously pretty evil. Um, and then also let's go to Esther, the book of Esther. And we'll see some more of the so-called deep state in action here. <laughs> uh, Esther chapter two. And this, this is a story about Mordecai and, uh, and uh, sorry, yeah, and Haman, Mordecai was the good guy. Haman was the bad guy here. And in verse 21 of Esther 2, it says, In those days, while Mordecai was sitting in the king's gate, two of the king's eunuchs, Bigthan and Teresh, who were doorkeepers, were angry and sought to assassinate King Ahasuerus. This thing became known to Mordecai, who told Esther the queen, and Esther informed the king in Mordecai's name, when this matter was investigated and it was found to be so, they were both hanged on a tree and in the presence of the king, it was written in the scroll of the events of the days. And in chapter three in verse one, it says, and after these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Amathia, the Agagite, <laughs> Aga, sorry, Agagite, and advanced him and set his seat of honor above all the officials who were with him. And all the king's servants who were with the king's gate kneeled and bowed down to Haman, for the king had commanded that concerning him, but Mordecai did not bow down. The king's servants who were the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you disobey the king's command? Now it came to pass when they spoke daily to him, he did not listen to them. And they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's reason would stand for he had told them that he was a Jew. 
When Haman saw that Mordecai did not kneel down or kneel or bow down, Haman was filled with rage, but he thought it beneath him to put forth his hand against Mordecai alone, for they had made known to him Mordecai's people. So Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, even all the people of Mordecai. Verse 7, in the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pur, that is, they cast a lot, before Haman from day to day and from month to month, and the lot fell in the twelfth month. And Haman said to King Ahasuerus, there is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of other people, and they do not keep the king's laws. So it is not in the king's best interest to allow them to remain. If it please the king, let it be written that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of server into the hands of those who are in charge of the king's business to put it into the king's treasure. So you can see how they were tempting him with money and power. In verse 10, it says, the king took his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of Hamadatha the Agagite, the enemies of the Jews. Uh, verse 11, the king said to Haman, the silver is given to you, the people also, to do with it as it seems good in your eyes. So boy, some pretty evil intentions here. But now Haman, the bad guy, had the signet ring. So what he would claim or do, he had that signet ring to supposedly substantiate his evil works. Um, and then in verse 12, it says, the king's scribes were called in on the first month of the 13th day of the month, and all that Haman commanded was written to the king's satraps and to the governors who were over every province and to the leaders of every people, to every province in its own script and to every people in their own language. And it was written in the name of King Ahasuerus, and it was sealed with the king's ring. So look at what he did. He used that authority for evil purposes. And it says in verse 14, a copy of the document to be issued as a decree in every province, province was proclaimed to all the peoples to be ready for the day. And the couriers went forth in haste at the king's command and the decree was given out of the palace fortress of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Shushan was thrown into confusion. So we got a lot going on here. <laughs> So we'll wrap this up and um, let's go to Esther, actually chapter seven. And we'll see kind of the conclusion of all this insanity. So Esther chapter seven and verse one, it says, <coughs> excuse me. So the king and Haman went into the banquet with Esther the queen. And on the second day of the banquet of wine, the king said to Esther, what is your petition, Queen Esther? It will be granted to you. What is your request? Even to the half of the kingdom, it will be done. <clears throat> then Esther, the queen answered, if I have found favor in your eyes, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given to me. This is my petition and my people. This is my request. For we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, to perish. But if we had merely been sold for male and female slaves, I would have kept silent for our distress for then our distress would not be worth troubling the king. And King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther the queen, who is he and where is he that dared in his heart to do this? And Esther said, the adversary and the enemy is this wicked Haman. And Haman was sitting right there and Haman was terrified before king and the queen. And the king arose in his wrath from the banquet and wine and went into the place of the garden. But Haman stayed to make his request for his life to Esther the queen, for he saw that harm had been determined against him by the king. Then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine, and Haman had fallen upon the couch where Esther was. And if you read the commentary, he had no good intentions towards Esther there. Uh, and the king said, will he even violate the queen in front of me in my own house? As the words went out of the king's mouth, the guards covered Haman's face and Harbona, one of the eunuchs who attended the king, said, Behold, a 75-foot stake that Haman has made for Mordecai, who spoke good on behalf of the king, is standing at Haman's house. And the king said, 
impale him on it. And so they impaled Haman on the stake that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath was abated. So what we see here is these evil people that end up falling into their own trap. And uh, the comment I made is it seems like the enemy always overplays his hand. And you can see that here with, with Haman and with also with uh, Jezebel. And then one other one I think we're all familiar with that I want to go to quickly is in the book of Daniel, because I think we're all familiar with the idea of Daniel in the lion's den. And a lot of many songs have been written about that. And, but what was interesting is that, you know, they put Daniel in the lion's den and the king put a stone on the, on the den so that he could not get out and he put his, his seal on there. And let's see if we're going to go to uh, you know, the best place to start here is uh, yeah, let me see. Uh, let's start in 16. It says, then the king commanded, they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spoke and said to Daniel, your God whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. A stone was laid was brought and laid at the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his Lord so that nothing would be changed concerning Daniel. And you can see the, you know, the nature when something is sealed like that, the intent is that it isn't going to be overturned. And then the king arose verily, uh, it says the king went from his, sorry, verse 18, the king went to his place their palace and passed the night fasting and no entertainment was brought into his presence and he slept and his slept, sorry, his sleep fled from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came near to the den of, to Daniel, he cried out with a lamentable voice. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, is your God whom you serve continually able to deliver you from the lions? Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth, and they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him and also before you, O king, I have done no harm. So even though that seal was there and there's no way he could have gotten out, well, obviously God saved him. And so we see how a seal is used as that impression of authority and it shows up in so many ways and uh, we're going to go into the new testament here so we'll see a few interesting verses also where the concept of the seal occurs and so we're going to go into romans and chapter four and we're going to start in verse eight of romans four so for all there it says Blessed is the man who sins, the Lord will not credit against him. Is this blessedness then for the circumcision only or for the uncircumcision also? For we say trust was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Under, the, under what circumstances then was it credited when he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not circumcised, but uncircumcised. And then he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by trust while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all those who believe but are not circumcised, that righteousness would be credited to them. So he had that seal of circumcision. And let's don't have to go deep into that, but that's something that isn't going to change. So, and, uh, you know, when they crucified Jesus, what did they do? They put, they rolled that stone and they not only had guards there, but they put a seal on that stone. And the seal was to ensure no tampering by the disciples. But of course, that didn't stop God. <laughs> so God rolled that stone away. And even though the seal was there, God's authority was greater than the authority of the people that put him there. So we're going to see that for us, the Holy Spirit is our seal. 
So we're going to go to 2 Corinthians. And in chapter 1, 2 Corinthians 1, and in verse 21 is where we'll start. And it says, now the one who is establishing us with you in union in Christ and has anointed us is God. Verse 22, who also sealed us and put the spirit in our hearts as the guarantee of what is to come. So we have been sealed. And that is a guarantee of what is to come. Who's going to break that seal? Ain't going to be the devil. He can't. <laughs> because God put it there. So we are sealed. Um, Ephesians chapter 4. You just see some great verses here. Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to go down to verse 29. Ephesians 4, 29. It says... Let no corrupting talk proceed out of your mouth, but only what is good for edifying according to the need so that it gives grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with which you were sealed until the day of redemption. We were sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. And then verse 31, it says, get rid of all bitterness and rage and angry shouting and defaming speech, along with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God has forgiven you in Christ. So, since we've been sealed, we are to act accordingly. You know, God sealed us, and then the encouragement here is to continue to walk in righteousness because we've been sealed. And in Second Timothy. Go to Second Timothy, and in chapter two of Second Timothy, and we're going to verses. We're starting verse fifteen. Second Timothy, chapter two, verse fifteen, and this kind of follows along with the, what we just read in Ephesians. It says, "Be diligent to present yourself approved before God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth." but avoid worldly empty chatter for it will lead to further ungodliness as their words will spread like gangrene among those as Hymenaeus and Philetus who have missed the mark concerning the truth saying that the resurrection has already occurred and they are overthrowing the trust of some. Verse 19, nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal. And that seal is the Lord knows those who are his and everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord must turn away from unrighteousness. So God's foundation is sealed. And God and the Lord knows those that are his. So I'm looking at a whole screen full of those that are his. As we've all been sealed. So our salvation is permanent because we have been sealed by being born again. So if we're born again, how are we going to get unborn? <laughs> you know, we physically we're all born. Spiritually, we are born again. We can't be unborn. Some people teach that you can lose their salvation. Well, I'm sorry, but that's not what the Bible teaches. So let's go to 1 Peter. And in chapter 1 of 1 Peter, And we read in verse 23, 1 Peter, for you have been born again, not from corruptible seed, but from incorruptible through the living and enduring word of God. So our, that birth that we have is incorruptible. It cannot change and it cannot be ended. So in closing, I want to just go back to Ephesians chapter one that we read before. And let's just, refresh our memory of some of the great verses in there. It's, and we'll, let's see, we'll go to, uh, let's see, where's a good place? So uh, verse, let's start in verse uh, seven and says, first Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our transgressions, 
according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us with all wisdom and insight, having made known to us the sacred secret of his will, according to his good pleasure that he planned before him, with a view to the administration of the fullness of times, to unite under one head all things in Christ, the things in heavens and the things on earth in him, in whom ye, we also were claimed as God's possession, having been decided upon in advance according to the purpose of the one who was working all things according to the plan of his will, to the end that we who had already hoped in Christ would be to the praise of his glory, in whom you also, when you heard the word of truth, the good news of your salvation, when you believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And we know that in the Old Testament, people could lose their spirit. I mean, when David sinned with Bathsheba, you know, I think it's uh, Psalm, is it Psalm 55? I forget now. I think it's Psalm 55 where it says, take not that Holy Spirit from me. He could lose it, but he didn't. We have been sealed with that Holy Spirit. We can't lose it. And that's what's great. So as kind of as a footnote, I thought it was interesting. What book do you think contains the most references to the concept of being sealed of all these things that we've read? The book of Revelation. Because the concept of being of a seal in the book of Revelation actually occurs 11 different times. And it reminded me of a great gospel bluegrass song or gospel blues song that was written quite a number of years ago back in 1930 by Bind Willie Johnson. I don't know if Doug Baker, if you've ever heard that song, but the song is John the Revelator. And it's a song about the gospel of John writing the book of Revelation, and it's uh, and the, the chorus goes, who's that writing? John the Revelator. He wrote the book of the seven seals. Now, in Revelation, there are seven seals, and nobody could break those seals except who? Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so I'd like to conclude. We're going to uh, have, have Michelle play a song called about being sealed so and then we can have any discussions that you'd like to have so michelle let her rip awesome thanks brian great teaching <laughs> 